Hi everyone, in this content we'll be discussing the scientific rigor of Dr. Berg's claims regarding muscle growth. I tend to get a considerable amount of backlash for correcting Dr. Berg, so I'll state my credentials while also providing scientific references for my corrections, should there be any. I'm a researcher currently pursuing my PhD in molecular medicine. I hold a master's degree in exercise physiology and I worked in a muscle metabolism laboratory. I also have a background in nutrition science from my undergraduate courses. So with that out of the way, let's dive in. Learn your body, a science-based education. Um, the myth is that you need just more protein to build muscle. Okay, so check this out. You eat protein, which is basically animal muscle. You might have eggs, you might have fish. It's the muscle of that animal. And you digest it, and your liver and your stomach and your intestines and enzymes start breaking down into these small particles or building blocks called amino acids. Okay, amino acids are the foundational building blocks of protein. So it takes certain acids, it takes certain enzymes to break it down, all right? And they're in your stomach, it's in the pancreas, it's in the liver, it's in the small intestine. So you have these enzymes. Um, so this whole conversion of breaking down the protein and then building it back up require these nutrients, okay? Vitamins and minerals and other things. So in other words, the purpose of vitamins and minerals are, are basically coenzymes or cofactors to help convert the raw material, amino acids, into body tissue or other like fatty acids into healthy tissue. So we need the vitamins for that. And we also need these vitamins and minerals to support the enzymes, which are the magical workers that pull this off. First, Dr. Berg discusses a protein myth wherein he claims we don't need more protein, we need more nutrients, minerals, to facilitate amino acids being used in the cells for the production of more muscle tissue. That's true that we need vitamins and minerals through direct and indirect means. Different molecules in our foods like zinc and iron, for example, speed up the reactions within our cells, allowing energy to be produced or for other key molecules to be produced to allow the muscle cell to use amino acids for protein production. As he stated, they're all called cofactors. But I wanna go through some common issues that people have that are, might not necessarily relate to nutrition in general. It relates to amount of sugar and refined carbs. So in the other videos, I talked about insulin resistance, okay? And that's a condition where your cells uh, no longer allow insulin into the cell as much as it should, so it's kind of blocked. And that's simply because there's too much sugar in the diet, so the body shuts it down because it's toxic, so it doesn't allow the cell to actually um, allow the, the sugar to go in the cell anymore. But because insulin is also involved in the absorption of um, protein and amino acids, you have this dual effect of now you can't get fuel, but you also can't get amino acids in the cell. So that's why diabetics, for example, have a lot of weakness in the muscle, loss of collagen, loss of muscle strength. And here's the animation how it works. You have the normal protein going in the cell with the help of insulin, like a key. And then over here you have insulin resistance where the cell is blocked, insulin can't enter anymore, and thus you have less protein in the cell, thus you have less muscle protein, collagen, joint tissue, you name it, okay? Next, he discusses insulin resistance and points out that it's a condition where an insulin isn't allowed into the cells because there's too much sugar around and it is toxic. He also points out that insulin is involved in the cell's absorption of amino acids. He's somewhat wrong here. Insulin binds the outside of the cell through the insulin receptor, but it does not enter the cell. Sugar, although it sounds good to label it as toxic, is not toxic. It's simply a nutrient that your cells absorb and break down for energy, as well as use it for other processes. As a matter of fact, if you abstain from sugar, your body will produce it because it is vital for life. Finally, he mentions that insulin is involved in the absorption of amino acids. Here, he has a point, because insulin binding the cells does promote more cellular energy production for more muscle synthesis, but also may have some direct effects on amino acid uptake from the bloodstream into the muscle cell. However, there are some insulin-independent ways that amino acids enter the muscle cells as well, and anyone who exercises, which is a prerequisite for muscle growth, will be more insulin-sensitive as well as uptake more amino acids regardless. 
So insulin resistance is one thing, and then you also have stress in general. Those people that are adrenal body type, they're stressed out. What happens, they're activating a hormone called cortisol. Cortisol is very, um, it's called catabolic. It's very destructive on the muscles, okay? Catabolic means breaking down. Anabolic means building back up. So when you have the muscle breaking down its particles in this animation, you can see these muscle uh, particles are breaking down because of the high levels of cortisol. It basically then converts to sugar, okay? So protein is being converted to sugar. If you wanna know the name of that, it's called glyconeogenesis. Sure, glyco meaning sugar, neo meaning new, genesis meaning the generation of, the formation of. Formation of new sugar from muscle. Eventually they get diabetes because the blood sugars go up because the muscle protein is turning into sugar. Next, he points out that high cortisol levels lead to the breakdown of muscle and that protein that is broken down from muscle is then converted to sugar. He's partly right here. Long-term cortisol levels of the blood can eventually lead to noticeable loss of muscle as it inhibits protein synthesis in the muscles, as seen in Cushing syndrome. Still, this is not as common as people think it is and is likely not a significant worry. Also, the process of converting amino acids, proteins to sugar, is not glyconeogenesis, but gluconeogenesis, occurring in the liver primarily. Okay, so here are the do's. You wanna do intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting triggers growth hormone. Growth hormone increases muscle uh, preservation and retention of muscle and muscle building, okay? So you need three meals, maybe two meals a day. Okay, I have tons of videos on that, you could watch that. This whole f four, five, or six small meals a day, not good, it spikes insulin, it keeps your protein from going in. Um, now, let's talk about snacks. Adding snacks spikes insulin, again, causes more protein problems. You would think that having protein snacks between the meals is gonna help your muscles, no. Um, so you don't wanna do any snacks because you wanna do intermittent fasting because that way you can heal insulin resistance, okay? Now, that's why the pre and post meals or even protein meals is a bad idea. Gatorade filled with sugar, not good because the sugar is what we're trying to counteract because it's creating the insulin resistance messing with your muscles, okay? Now, as far as uh, a lot of people, this is a mistake they make, they have protein powder, so uh, whey protein powder, thinking they're gonna drive all this protein into the muscle, uh, but that's gonna spike insulin. <laughs> You'd be better off having a fattier protein. The, the more fat, the less insulin spike, the better, okay? Moderate amount of protein, okay? Three to six ounces. Don't go with like massive amounts of protein like I see people just eating so much protein thinking that's helping them when it's just overloading the liver. Your body can't handle that much protein. It just puts stress in the liver. If you're 18 years old, you can pretty much handle it, but eventually it starts slowing down. I don't even think at 18 you could probably handle too much. Uh, then we have the type of exercise. If you ever see a long distance runner, they don't look very muscular, do they? They, they kind of have smaller muscles, uh, probably because of the carbo loading or, or just the glucose they consume. If you take marathon runners, uh, they have this thing called goo, which is this pure sugar, and they're taking this sugar, they're running out, they're doing a lot of carbs. Uh, unfortunately, that's gonna create more insulin resistance and block the muscle. Not to mention, the sustained exercise increases cortisol and it causes muscle wasting. A much better exercise would be high intensity interval training because that can spike growth hormone and preserve your muscles as well. Short bursts of high intensity exercise, full body, very important. Sleep is also necessary to increase growth hormone. Um, stress is not good, so these are the things you don't wanna do, these are the things you want to do. Finally, he mentions the do and don'ts, and here he gets some right and some wrong. Intermittent fasting, for example, is the worst way to gain muscle optimally. That isn't to say you can't build muscle on intermittent fasting protocols, but it isn't optimal. If you look at the data from the study that compared the consumption of protein twice a day versus four times a day versus eight times a day, the four times a day was superior to the two other for stimulating protein synthesis. There's nuance here, but this is agreed upon by other studies as well. So consume protein every three to four hours for the best results. He does mention that intermittent fasting increases growth hormone, and he's not wrong. He's also right that growth hormone preserves muscle mass, but it still isn't as potent as four meals consisting of protein. 
He also mentions that you shouldn't eat more meals in the day because it spikes insulin. But as we've discussed, insulin is beneficial to muscle growth in that it facilitates amino acids entering the muscle cells. Dr. Berg even said it himself earlier, so this contradicts. In the same vein, he says not to snack so you don't raise insulin so you can heal insulin resistance. Now he's talking about a different audience, however. If you aren't diabetic, none of this applies to you. If you are diabetic, there's some truth here that goes beyond the scope of this discussion. He also discusses consuming fattier proteins over whey protein because whey protein raises insulin. He's not wrong that whey does increase insulin, but again, this isn't an actual issue because insulin is beneficial to muscle growth, and whey protein is classified according to multiple studies as one of the best, if not the best, proteins to consume for muscle growth because it contains high levels of key amino acids that stimulate muscle growth greatly. Total protein consumption should be moderate, according to him. That's okay, as there is an upper threshold where more protein doesn't help significantly. So I'd agree there too. However, the liver is more than capable of handling excess protein. This isn't an issue for moderately healthy individuals. I'd get more specific, but there are no specific claims beyond, well, stress on the liver, which could be anything. Rest assured, the liver is plenty healthy, consuming high protein if you don't have any pre-existing conditions. Nearing the end, he mentions that long distance exercise increases cortisol, and he's right there. However, the more likely reason those individuals do not gain muscle is because of the intensity of the exercise isn't high enough to build muscle, not because of insulin resistance. As a matter of fact, long distance exercisers have some of the best insulin sensitivity of anyone on planet Earth. So Dr. Berg definitely missed the mark on that one. Finally, he mentions sleep and its importance because of the growth hormone. He's absolutely right, along with many other benefits of sleep. I completely agree. So overall, Dr. Berg gets several things right and several things wrong, according to the science. I hope you found this informative, and if you did, feel free to check out some of my other breakdowns, which you can find attached to this content for you. Until next time, bye.